Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We're making a big switch around here this weekend. At some point, right around the time Patrick Mahomes is landing at BWI to come in here and be undefeated and a Super Bowl champion, uh, we're going to be merging WNST with our new brand at Baltimore Positive. Uh, I am positively sure you're going to be enjoying that. All brought to you by our friends at Sport of Culture and Taharka, all of our friends coming together in a pretty good start to the Ravens season. I'm back from Houston. I wrote a blog. Uh, you can read about my travels and travails and hydroplaning on I-45 in the middle of Hurricane Beta. And uh, others are doing the same thing. Blair Kirkhoff has been traveling with the Kansas City Chiefs as long as I can remember. All the Kansas City guys and gals have uh, been running around in a Super Bowl year and a parade and then just incredible weirdness for all of us. Uh, Blair writes uh, for the Kansas City Star. You can follow him out on Twitter. I'm going to be on his podcast, apparently keeping better company than usual on Thursday in Kansas City. Um, do I get some Jack Stack? Like, did you just send me some of the onion rings or something, Blair? Just something, just something small to make me feel like you came from Kansas City, man. Yeah, man. If uh, You can get some Jack Stack. If I can get some Obrickies or Phillips or you got to give, give me Fadley's some Fadley's or our, our clients and sponsors. I Fadley's Crab Cakes for you. You're in there on you Monday. Go. I will make Make sure you do not have a tourist. We still sell crab cakes here in the middle of a pandemic. We do. And barbecue as well here in, uh, in the middle of America. Well, your team's pretty good. Our team's pretty good. Um, the quarterbacks are pretty good. The, the weirdness of all of this for me, and you can speak to your Los Angeles experience, and I've written about my Houston experience, is that when the game starts, and especially when you're home and watching on TV, and they pipe in some noise, um, it still looks like football. ACLs aside, and we'll talk about all that, but these two teams the last two weeks look like the Andy Reid, John Harbaugh tree of leadership, all in, working, that they've been preparing to play football very capably. No, no doubt about that. I, I would say especially the Ravens. Uh, more impressive in their two victories than the Chiefs, at least in the – the last time out for, for Kansas City, uh, really, at, at, at L.A., opening up SoFi Stadium and needing a 58-yard field goal to walk off the Chargers. So quite a uh, sort of a, a, a near-loss experience for, for Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. But they found a way to get it done and didn't play, didn't play their best football and, uh, and, and, and go uh, take a 2-0 and record to, to Baltimore for Monday night. So they're feeling pretty good about themselves. And, look, you know, they had a parade in February. So any, any, and Baltimore knows about parades and, and uh, NFL and Super Bowl champion teams. Anytime you have that, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. And, and the Chiefs do feel pretty good at 0-2. Well, I mean, you guys had a lot more fun out there. You had that little uh, royal dynasty going on for a while. And, I mean, we, we always think it's going to be long-term. I mean, $400 million in champagne for Mahomes and all that stuff. Um, you know, these injuries this last week and should be shocking to everybody. And that's obviously the worst nightmare around here for number eight. Uh, and as much as he seems to seek contact, you know, I mean, all of these young quarterbacks to some degree, the thing that makes them so special, their legs uh, and the ability to run. And I know all the studies have been done about standing still in the pocket versus being on the fly. And, but every time our quarterback goes down, I mean, I'm like, you know, that's it. That's all you got. And he's taking on contact 18, 20, 24 times a game. Yeah, there's no doubt about it with uh, uh, the, the people in, in Kansas City feel the same way about Patrick Mahomes. I remember the first time Mahomes and Jackson hooked up, um, Jackson didn't finish the game. Uh, he, uh, RG3 ended up finishing that game in 2018 at Arrowhead because Lamar was knocked out of the game in the, the overtime. So uh, the, the, absolutely, every time Patrick Mahomes gets hit, and he got hit a lot in L.A. Uh, on Sunday, and got sacked once. So every time people, uh, people hold their breaths here. And he was knocked out of a, a game last year, week seven game at Denver uh, with a kneecap, cost him two games, two, two plus games, but then came back and, and did what he did in the postseason, which was remarkable stuff. And I, I am, I'm convinced that we're going to see the two best quarterbacks in the NFL on, on Monday night. And I think they're going to be the two best quarterbacks in this league for the foreseeable future. For you in watching this maturation of Mahomes and, 
you know, finally a coronation for Andy Reid, who knows a lot about barbecue. I, I've had a lot of barbecue conversations with Andy Reid over years uh, before he got to Kansas City, quite frankly. He was in Philly. But um, in his relationship with Brian Billick, who I've known forever, uh, everyone feels good for Andy. What keeps Andy up at night right now? Like, what, what, what about this team from last year has looked different to you to put them into a situation where – we're all nail biting. I mean, I was watching my own game in Houston, um, but, but watching them get into trouble in a game very early in the season, that's probably should work as a little bit of a wake up call for what the, you know, what the aftermath of the parade feels like. Yeah, that's a good question. I think going into the season, this is a team that felt great about itself. In, in, right after the Super Bowl, the narrative was 20 of 22 starters returning. Well, then the, then, then our COVID summer hit and, uh, and and then two players opted out the running back Damian Williams offensive guard Laurent Duvernay Tardif both uh, opted out doctor, there were some right? other the doctor 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 Laurent Duvernay Tardif remained in Quebec to uh, to to battle the COVID and the coronavirus on the front line so uh, but they filled that they filled that spot and it lets they filled those spots first of all uh, Tardif with uh, Kalichi Osemele former uh, Pro Bowl offensive guard who's done a nice job in two games and at running back, their first-round pick was Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. Now, they didn't pick him knowing they were going to lose Damian Williams, but it just turns out the Chiefs went with the running back and with their first pick this year, and, and he had a terrific first game against the Texans, a game that uh, we all, everybody in Kansas City was excited about, and then they just saw what the Ravens did uh, with the Texans' run defense on, on Sunday. So kind of look back and see, did uh, was, was that real, the 138 yards by by Clyde against the Texans? or? Anyway, uh, so those were the, you know, they had a lot of, a lot of personnel, uh, key personnel, but they had a great offseason, not only the big contract to Mahomes, from Mahomes, but getting uh, Chris Jones resigned, taking care contract-wise of Travis Kelsey, Sammy Watkins, other stars that, uh, that needed to be paid and extended, and that happened. So a lot of good vibes coming into this season. But I think, you know, like most teams, Baltimore not included in this, you know, without a preseason, you still have some kinks to work out. And, uh, and, and the, I think the Chiefs have done a little bit of that in the first two weeks. It showed, showed up on Sunday, played better the first week than the second week. But they um, uh, offensive line didn't have a good game. A lot of penalties against the Chargers. Uh, again, the, the pressure and the hits of, on Mahomes was, was a little distressing. So that is absolutely a, a part of the game that needs to be shored up for, for Kansas City. But I got to tell you, Nestor, this is a team that is, it's at least through two weeks we think – Top three quarterback in Mahomes, top three tight end in Travis Kelsey, a top five wide receiver in Tyree Kill, depth at that position. And now, you know, one of the best kickers in the NFL with Harrison Butker, given what he did on, on Sunday with 258 yarders, including the game winner. But they've got, they got some of the best players in the NFL at some key positions. And, uh, and I, it, this is a team that's going to win the division. It's going to be in the playoffs. And I think this week three game, is going to be a, a precursor to the AFC championship game. Well, I mean, we're all looking for something, right? After six months that the season would start up. And uh, with all due respect to our friends up in Philadelphia, you're still waiting for the season to start, but it might be over before it starts. Uh, you know, the, the mess with baseball. And if, I mean, and you're in a town without a hockey team or a basketball team, much like us. So, you know, all that Orlando bubble and we're going to go to Toronto and I, none of that existed that, how important football is to you know Chiefs fans and the Ravens fans that in the middle of a plague it really does kind of suck that you know there's not going to be seventy two thousand people and the Mahomes is just going to be able to come in and work under center and do whatever he wants and you know motion and um, and Lamar had the same situation in Houston you know all the travel stuff and and I I wrote about that at the site but from a football perspective one thing I did not write about is being on the road is a benefit this year. If, you know, like Patrick Mahomes' night on Monday, no matter how it goes, it's going to be a better night than it would have been if my wife was in the upper deck screaming at him. I promise well, you that. Yeah, look, I, I think what we're looking at this season, for, for most teams, most weeks are neutral site type games, right? Uh, you're not playing in front of fans. And the, well, you the had Chiefs, some noise in your building on the opening night, right? Absolutely. The Chiefs have, uh, have allowed in up to – it's about 16,000. But it sounds like it. a high school game, kind of, sort of, right? It does. It's 16,000 <laughs> in a 75,000-seat stadium. So I don't think there's much of an impact there. Uh, so from a, from a TV standpoint, what it means is they don't have to pipe in noise 
at Arrowhead uh, the, because the 15, 16,000 will make enough to, to, to sound audible on a broadcast. But, you know, it was it, what a bizarre sensation it was uh, in, in, at SoFi Stadium, one of the new wonders of the world, right? The $5 billion stadium in, you know, near. I saw near the no- fountains on TV. I just wanted yeah. to get in there and swim, Blair. That's all. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's like the, yeah, like the Kauffman Stadium outfield. Uh, but just, you know, um, 75,000 seats can go up to 100,000, $5 billion uh, building. And the only people in there were the teams, a handful of media, some Chargers personnel, and the, the Chiefs owner, Clark Hunt, and his family were in the suite above the, uh, above the Chiefs uh, sideline. So I, we'll never, never, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll never have another season like this. We'll never experience another you know, season we're like We're living this. through a parable, right? I mean, what you just said, $5 billion and no one can go in, but it looks great on television. Right, right. So you get Jim Nance and Tony Romo telling everybody what a great building it is. You got to take their word for it, right? And well, they did and the I, same thing on Monday night. I sat and watched Monday night football. Mark Davis is showing me the dome in the city that I can't visit. Right. Can't stay in a hotel. Can't get a beer. Can't do all the things I like to do in Vegas. And I'm thinking, well, I mean, I guess one day Mick will live long enough. We'll see the Stones play there. I guess you know. I <laughs> at least I hope, right? Right, right, right. It's gonna be. It's going to be a grand experience when fans can go to Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas and make a big weekend out of it, but ain't happening this year. And, you know, uh, you know hopefully we'll, this, won't happen, this won't bleed into 2021 and we'll have it settled by then. But hopefully a lot of things will be settled uh, by 2021. Blair Kirkhoff is our guest. Uh, he's a reporter for the Kansas City Star, reporting on all things royal and chief. And, uh, and, and for, for all of society to stop on these two weekends and sort of watch football again, uh, it's been the only normal thing that I've had in seven months. And, and once the game starts and your team's good, uh, and you get to go on social media and wear your red hat or your purple hat or whatever it is, there is something sort of soothing about all of this at a time of incredible crisis in our country that um, I'm happy they're playing. I, I didn't think they should have played much of the summer, Blair. Right. I, I, I totally agree. Um, and let's, let's give some kudos to the NFL for doing the best job uh, of, the, uh, of the professional sports in handling the – you know, the, the coronavirus, they have no, no positive tests for a couple of weeks. It's just, they've done an amazing job. Look, my hat's off sending out hundred thousand dollar envelopes to the coaches for spitting on each other. Right. <laughs> I mean, it looks serious to me, right? Yeah. 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 Hey, look, I, I, I salute the NBA uh, and, and the, the job that the NBA has done, the NHL in their finals now. And uh, we, we have sports on television I love it. In fact, there's more sports on television now than there ever has been. Too right? much. Yeah, too much. Yeah, I, I can't. I, I, you know, I, I Sunday night, I, I got no time for the Lakers when Cam Newton's driving for <laughs> Bill Belichick. I mean, That's you right. know, we got dogs and cats together. Tom Brady's wearing orange. I mean, um, the season's on, and the season has become, I guess, the um, – the antidote to talking about Donald Trump and Joe Biden, right? Like, you know, and wherever the side of the political spectrum is, we, we've really lacked this. And I, not just as two old sports writers, right? It's been a great, I'll tell you what, it's been a great distraction from that. I'll t- if, if COVID had come, come along, I don't know, two or three months later, and we were in the sports void right now, and all we had was politics uh, and the news, uh, my gosh, but um, uh, where would we be? And it's already – look, and besides the coronavirus, it's been such a tough year. You were down in Houston. You saw the effects of, uh, you know, the hurricanes and the Gulf. I, I was in California last weekend. I saw the effects of the forest fires in, the, in California. It's just been a it, – it's been one of those years. It, it just 2020, we'll, we'll look back on this year, and, and, and it'll rank up there with some of the years that are just most newsworthy and unforgettable gettable for for some of the wrong reasons but football was being played nfl football was being played in mostly empty stadiums but by by athletes who we recognize that we appreciate and that i think have delivered in two weeks a pretty good product considering the circumstances so lamar versus patrick mahomes uh you know bring out the sports writer in you is lamar ever going to beat patrick mahomes in a game you know was it in your mind that 
uh, you were going to come in here last year and have a crab cake and be ready for that big AFC championship. By the way, we've never hosted an AFC championship game here, right? Like, so I, you know, I was talking to some of your, your sages out there in Kansas city about all of those 13 and threes and 14 and twos and Montana's and Schottenheimer's and everything that happened after Len Dawson, right? That you, you never did it till last year. We've had two parades and the strangest thing for me would be a whole season where we're this good and we're pretty good. And we have games and playoff games for no one and then have a Super Bowl in Tampa for no one, right? And then there's, then there's a parade that would be socially distanced on a 12-degree day in Kansas City or a 28-degree day in Boston. It, that part of it I haven't played out in my mind. These games are fun, but what happens if you actually win? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I think that is a it's a predicament that either franchise is willing to uh, to you know to welcome, right? Um, well, I remember your Royals parade was legendary. I mean, off I, the hook. You know, it was off crazy. Uh, more people at that than the Chiefs parade. You wouldn't think an NFL parade would be out outdrawn by a World Series champion, but that was the th- that was the thirty year gap of of championships in Kansas. Man, City. And I sat World. out in right field in that club before they ripped the seats out when the Orioles got their ass kicked. And, you know, I was there, I was down. I, I didn't even have the heart to ask Buck Showalter a question after, you know, <laughs> after that game. But I watched the joy that your community I – mean, I'm wearing a Royal Blue Raskin Global shirt here. There you go. Royals. There you go. Um, and Luke and I – and Luke's the biggest Oriole fan in the world. And we couldn't even muster much but a smile as we drove out of that parking lot at how joyful – and that's what sports does, right? You've had that experience. I've had that experience because I've gone to the World Series, Super Bowls. We've seen all that. I mean, even watching your fans go nuts in Miami, the last time I flew before this weekend was flying home from the Super Bowl back in February, right? And I, I walked out of the stadium that night, and I, I just felt great for every Chiefs fan I ever knew who suffered, you know? I'll, I'll tell you, it was the, it was the Royals uh, World Series championship in 2015 that changed the way that I looked at championships. And, you know, as much as I appreciated the, the greatness of the Patriots and the respect the dynasty of the, of, of the Lakers and in the day, the Steelers, Cowboys and others, I just, after 2015, I just felt so great for the Cleveland Cavaliers, for the Philadelphia Eagles, for the St. Louis Blues, these organizations and franchises that went so long. Put the Cubs and, in there, too. And, put them and, uh, in there, too. Well, that should have, I should have led with the Cubs. I buried the lead. <laughs> but organizations that went so long, either between or never experienced, in the case of the Cavaliers or the Blues, that type of success. And what that does to a city I'll tell you what, you could not find any Royals gear in any store for a year after the Royals won the World Series. People, you couldn't go to an airport in the country that with a flight coming back to Kansas City where people weren't decked out. That's what that does, especially to a market the size of Kansas City. We're not New York. We're not L.A. We're not the Bay Area. You know, we're, we're, we're metropolitan, uh, about 2 million people, metropolitan area. Everybody everybody get, got along. We're torn by our college sports in this market. You're Kansas, Missouri, Kansas State, but everybody is Chiefs and everybody is Royals. And it, it, both of those championships had a galvanizing effect on this community. And probably will for the next 15 years. A- absolutely. There, absolutely. Right? My gosh. Just, you know, just like with the, I think people, Ravens fans think Lamar Jackson is the guy and he's going to be the guy. And I know in this town, especially after signing a, you know, a 10-year, uh, half-billion-dollar contract. They're, Kansas City has hitched its fortunes to Patrick Mahomes, and they're going to ride or die with that guy for, you know, if you're, if you're in elementary school through your college years, you know, you are going to be a Patrick Mahomes guy. They're going to sell more number 15 jerseys in Kansas City than, uh, than all the George Brett number five jerseys were ever sold. For you being, uh, you know, the grizzled vet and, you know, seeing this kid come in and be the son of a pitcher, you know, and a, and so, and a, and a thoughtful pitcher and a big leaguer and, a, you know, guy that had to think through all of these things and being an athlete, being a perfect uh, uh, – uh, Brian Billick would always say, Give me the son of a coach. <laughs> you know, that's who I want to draft. You know, that was Brandon Stokely. That was Jim Harbaugh, right? It's John Harbaugh, right? In the case of Mahomes, there's something really special about him. And the fact that, you know, dad played another sport to, as well. 
absolutely. And, he, and Patrick grew up loving baseball because of that. Um, and, and probably at one time thought that was going to be his path. And why wouldn't you think that, right? Not only, not only because his dad, but his, his godfather is LaTroy Hawkins. So two great you know, influences in his life were, were longtime Major League Baseball players. Uh, but, but he grows up in Texas, right? And football is king in Texas, and, and he becomes that. But it's, it's um, you know, a story that Patrick t- tells a lot that uh, growing up in a clubhouse, and there's a there's a great story about uh, uh, about how he you know his dad wanted to to have him hit off of a tee when he was a kid you know seven eight year, years old and Patrick says what well, I don't need to hit off of a tee I I can hit pitching you know just throw me the ball and then he goes outside onto the field and he sees Alex Rodriguez hitting off of a tee and after that Patrick Mahomes kind of understood what it took even at that age to you know to build the the, the levels of uh, of success. So I always thought that was an interesting story by him when, when he saw A-Rod hitting off a tee and understanding that there is no shortcut. you got to do it this way. You know, I, I always tell the story about, you know, Eddie Murray was much maligned here, you know, uh, and, and got chased out and Hall of Fame career and all that. And, you know, one of the things that they said on the radio about him 40 years ago was, you know, he didn't, he didn't play hard. Because, you know, he, I saw him after he retired at about 6 o'clock in the morning taking a bucket and a fungo bat onto the backfields <laughs> for these kids wearing number 81 jerseys and hitting them fungos. And I'm thinking the stuff that fans never saw in the seventies and the eighties that they have maybe access. I mean, if you're an unenlightened fan now, it's because you choose to be an unenlightened fan, right? Like I, you know, th- to know how much science, what these guys are doing all week that I think we've tried to chronicle throughout our careers. Now, I think at least fans have some, some idea that these guys, that it's not North Dallas 40 or semi-tough, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. that, that it's not, right? No, that, that's right. That's right. And, and, and this is, you know, in, in an age where uh, the, the time that you described, by the way, I, I, I loved Eddie Murray uh, when I was a kid. I, I, I loved him. And I know he, he didn't talk to the media and he was presented as, a, because then the only way you can present an athlete was through print media usually and, uh, and, and a little bit of radio. but I, I always, I always loved him as a ball player, and uh, and a great, great success, deserved his Hall of Fame uh, induction. But um, you know, today, how how difficult it is is it to be an athlete in the in the social media world where every human being is a journalist because they have a cell phone, and you can't do anything without someone taking your photo and or video and posting it and in trying to you know. Uh, trying to make a name for yourself as a, you know, as a citizen. Look what I, look what I did. I think it's more difficult now for the professional athlete to be out there than it ever was I- before. And, but, but it's good and bad too, right? I mean, it, it also provides opportunities, especially if you're an athlete that can manage your own image and manage your, you know, you know your likeness and, and be able to market that in a way that, somebody like Eddie Murray couldn't. Can you imagine a, a player like Eddie Murray? And I think of Albert Bell, too, remember his, his reputation for the Indians? Well, the whole sport of baseball, right? Like, yeah. just over the course of time. And, you know, Angelos took my press pass famously in 2006 for telling the truth. 14 years later, he's eating pudding, and I still don't go to baseball games, and no one goes to baseball games anymore. I guess that's part of the, you know, the, the parable catching up as well. But baseball and, and how it's twisted so, I would like to ask you, I'll ask all the kids, I'm going to ask Jeff Montgomery and Brian McRae, all these guys. Like, it's amazing to me how quickly it went away, the, the Royals, that, that, that magic, not just in the players, but that all of a sudden, you know, it goes from sold out to not sold out. We went through that here in Baltimore 29 years ago now, and Cal Ripken and all of that, we relived all of that this year, that um, – Man, if you're not winning, and baseball as a sport itself, maybe in Kansas City, still super cool. We have lacrosse here, right? Like, we're the cradle of lacrosse. I am gravely concerned about baseball, and it really is. They haven't marketed themselves very well. They haven't. They haven't. I've I've been to a game at Hopkins, by the way. I've uh, I've done a little little lacrosse reporting in my day, but – no, there's, there's, there isn't anything like that here. And I understand the issues that are, that are in Baltimore. And I think like, like the Orioles, the Royals – well, first of all, one thing that's different is the Royals don't have to contend with the payrolls of the teams in their division the way that the Orioles have. That's, 
I mean, that's Mission Impossible, I, I think. Yeah, you're or, always fighting King Kong. Yes, always, always. A couple of them now. Uh, and the Royals don't have that, at least not to that extent. Now, and that's some shame of best- on baseball, by the way, just structurally. Yeah, no, no doubt. And the Royals fans for 30 years in between championships, that was a, that was a rallying cry for – Well, for you, fans. Pittsburgh, every, you know, oh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, San Diego, a, a lot of them. But, but um, look, uh, it, it, it did end quickly, right? It ended abruptly. So after the, World's 20, uh, after the 2015 World Series championship, there were two 500-record teams and then followed by, by two 100-loss seasons here – and, uh, and, and so Ned Yost, and a big pile of who's going to get the money? Who what are we going to give Mustak? Is we going to give Kane? That's Who, right. Pitcher, are we going to keep? I mean, and and it's hard to keep that together, especially when you don't have the resources to be the Yankees or the pipeline to have Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, right? Right. Well, that that's exactly right. The Royals had to make a decision after 2015 because they had so many of the free agents come into the market at the same time. Who are they going to keep? Who are they going to sign? And you know, who, who what can they what kind of trade value? Interesting decision the Royals made. They traded Wade Davis the lights out closer for Jorge Soler, the promising, you know, outfielder for the Cubs with a great bat. And at the time people here were really ticked off. Wade Davis was, was tremendous for the Royals when, when in, in a Royals uniform. We didn't have a seventh year. inning in that series. As I remember. Oh, it was, it was unbelievable, right? You remember that. And, um, <laughs> uh, but, but so the decision was made, do, do you, are you playing for the future? It seemed to be the case there, but then they, but then they re-signed, they gave Mustakas a contract. So they were trying to do both things. And it didn't work out. So now they are back to total rebuild. And they're doing it in a division. I mentioned divisions where there's a lot of good young prospects. The White Sox are a good team, a team on the rise. Detroit has great pitching coming up. Um, and, and the Twins and the Indians have ruled this division now for four or five years. So, um, look, I love talking baseball. <laughs> well, Blair, you know, I, I, I'll leave you with this. In the uh, summer of 1983, my, my dad came in from work, said, where do you want to go this summer? And my mom always loved the fountains. And you know, my parents were born in 1919, so they passed. Uh, but they were, they were older then. They were more like my grandparents. We got on a bus, a Greyhound bus, went to St. Louis in Kansas City and did the Gateway Arch and the Budweiser Brewery. We, we, I, saw, I saw Ric Flair and Harley Race wrestle at the Keel. And we went out to Kansas City and had these great pictures of my parents in the middle of the parking lot in front of Arrowhead and in front of Royal Stadium. And I saw Gaylord Perry pitch and Don Sutton on a doubleheader. So, I mean, I've always – love Kansas City. It's one of my favorite places to come and be on a trip. And, um, you know, we have to play you out there and I get barbecue in an empty stadium in January. I'll consider it a win for 2021. How about that? All right. Perfect. Perfect. Take care of yourself and look forward to joining you later in the week. All right. All right, Nestor. Sounds good, buddy. Blair Kirkhoff joining us here. He is reporter for the Kansas City Star, man. We're geezing and wheezing and telling old stories like two old sports writers. You can find him at Blair Kirkhoff. That's B-L-A-I-R K-E-R-K-H-O-F-F and at KansasCity.com. Kansas City, here I come. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, merging. WNST.net with Baltimore Positive and eating some pretty good pizza at Pizza John's along the way. We are WNST.net AM 1570 and we never stop talking. Baltimore Positive.